Good day folks and welcome to the Anorak Review Show with I, your host, the Anorak. It figures that I do a review of another Jeffro Tull album, not only because it's been almost a year since the first time I did so, being Aqualung from 1971, but also the band made a surprise return with the recent comeback album, The Zealot Gene. Although I'd say that a little bit loosely since it's mostly Ian Anderson and no other returning members of the band. Instead, newer members and whatnot. Never to disparage any of them though, just pointing out. Anyways, to celebrate this occasion, I've set out to look into an album made back in the heyday of the 1970s again. For this one, they decided to take on a more folky approach and direction, inspired by English pagan folklore and living in the wilderness and countryside, while still fusing with some conventional hard rock and progressive rock elements. So, just to get to the point sooner or later, let's take a listen at Jeff Toll's 1977 album, Songs from the Wood, and see if they managed to accomplish such. We begin our album with the title track, Songs from the Word. No, not that kind of word, but from the forests. Right off the get-go, this song sets the tone for the album as a whole. It starts off with some pretty nice barbershop style a cappella vocals from Ian Anderson himself. Similar to the opening of Dancing with the Moon at Night by Genesis, which also has some English folk influences, interestingly enough. And even a bit of a whimsical flute like out of an old Disney film. Then at the 40 minute mark, we eventually get some other instrumentals kicking in and enhancing the folksiness. With a lute and electric guitar played by Martin Barr, bass guitar by John Glascock, some drumming from Barrymore Barlow, and even a bit of organ sounding synths by John Evan and Dee Palmer. The way Ian delivers his his vocals throughout this, it, it's kind of like a minstrel singing poetically about the open wilderness and nature. Being a bit flowery, if you pardon the pun, kind of reminded me a bit of the Rack and Bass Middle Earth films. He even described himself as a wind to fill your sail, a cross to take your nail, and a singer of these timeless, ageless times. So, if he's a cross to take a nail, does that mean he's being crucified? Or rather, he's having someone be crucified on him? I don't know. A, a repeating line that occurs in this is, Songs from the wood make you feel much better. Which I'm sure is very true among many rock fans, like myself, that enjoy this album. The instrumental sections in between the vocals are also really good, going from light and fun to being dramatic and intense, complete with, with crashing cymbals and everything. And then it goes into a little false halt that as we get another brief return of the a cappella and reprisal of the intro, then we finally get to a kick clashing halt. It honestly, it's honestly no wonder why so many people, including Ian himself, love this song and would consider this to be one of the best Jeffro Tull songs out there, combining folk and rock music just perfectly and giving some, some just some good old English charm, it's pure musical delight. Next is Jack in the Green, a two and a half minute long acoustic ballad about a mythical creature named, well, Jack in the Green. This was named after a particular part tradition in the May Day holiday, where someone would wear a big cone-shaped framework covered in foliage. Hmm. I wonder what I should review for May Day when it comes this year. Hmm. Feel free to offer some suggestions in the comments down below, perhaps. Anyways, the lyrics here vaguely describe what this Jack looks like, with a long tail, a velvet gown, and using a cane to tap and signal snowdrops to grow. So, a little bit like a pixie or a brownie or whatnot. The song then goes on to say how being Jack in the Green is no fun, no time to sing or no place for a dance. Well, as Cupboard would say, 
it's not easy being green. And Jack wears the colours of the Summer Soldier and carries the green flag all the winter long. And he no doubt has to face the Winter Soldier, Bucky Barnes. Then it questions if the changing times, power lines and motorways and all, are keeping us all apart. Ourselves and Jack representing nature and obviously referring to the never end, the never, the ever of modernizing world and advances in technology and how easily it could separate us all and distance us from our roots in nature. But then Ian recalls one day seeing grass growing through some pavements, hinting at the possibility that Jack isn't really out just yet and that we still have some tie to nature. Well, it seems a good time than ever to pull out some weed, weed killer. I joke some more, but honestly, this, this is another sweet track. It's got some decent guitar strumming, and Ian still gives the vocals his all. Even though the song itself does seem to end on a rather abrupt halt. After that is Cup of Wonder. Continuing off the themes of the previous song, this has a ton more references to May Day, right down to mentioning its original name, Beltrain. In the first verse, Ian sings about being late for the festival, but gladly accepting the invitation anyway, and bringing Beltrain's flower, likely referring to the sun itself and how it brings life to the plants and whatnot with its, with its sun rays. Then the chorus comes in, where we get a repeating of pasta, as in pass the word and pass the lady, pass the plate to all who hunger, ancient wisdom, cup of Christmas, or crep of crimson wonder, etc. And don't forget to pass the salt as well. And in the second verse, Ian mentions about asking where the green man comes from. The green man in question is an ancient nature, ancient nature, spirit of nature of old English folklore, often depicted as a large bearded face made of various leaves and plants. And in the third and last, a few months are mentioned, such as the sadness of Black December, the welcoming corn of August, and of course May Day. As for the music itself, it's a very well done balance of classic folk music and modern funky pop, with the flute returning, as well as some more bass and acoustic guitar, and a neat jam of synths in some of the instrumental sections. This is both mellow and jumpy, and even a bit catchy at times, which I can enjoy a bit of. Even if something like Aqualung, for instance, wasn't intended to be a concert album, this album is certainly is one, to say the least so far. Then we have Hunting Girl, a slightly more traditional rock-sounding piece that still features a leading flute playing along most of it, but the keyboards and electric guitars still manage to come forth into play and fill in. Almost similar to something out of Yes or King Crimson, Martin Barr really does his best whenever he plays guitar here as an answer slash response to the call of the pan-like flute and the synthesizers. Then about a minute and 10 seconds in, Ian's vocals step in from the point of view of a normal, low-born character travelling across the roads and fields along with some hounds. Then he comes across a fine, young, high-born lady riding on horseback. A huntress, if you will. Ian unlocks the gate to... somewhere, and the hunting girl waits, waits a while until the pack of hounds have gone. Admiring her leather boots and spurs, while admitting she has some strange tastes, Ian then goes down to his knees with her standing over him and... Well, I'll leave the detail to your imagination. The song itself does. Anyway, he goes back to his feet and heads back to his farm, slightly hinting that this experience between the two may not be their last. What I like about the track is that, even though it's somewhat sexual in a way, it's surprisingly not all that explicit. Rather, Lenda's listeners fill in the rest as dirty as our minds can be. Side 1 ends with Ring Out Solstice Bells, 
possibly the closest thing to a Jeff Will Tell Christmas song before their actual Christmas album. I'm not kidding, the Jeff Will Tell Christmas album, that was a thing, look it up. In fact, this was apparently written to be a, a potential Christmas single, but the folks at Chrysalis Records, the label that distributed the Jeff Will Tell albums at the time, didn't like how the song was in 7-4 time, so they requested the band if they could re-record it in standard 4-4 time, which they weren't exactly pleased with. But nonetheless, they went ahead and made a new version titled Magic Bells. But then, for whatever reason, the higher-ups decided to just scrap the new version altogether at seemingly the last minute, and just instead release the original version as is. Uh, talk about a waste of effort. You demand them to make a new version of a song to, in order to suit your standards, and then decide, eh, you know what, forget about it, we'll release the original as a Christmas single if you want. Anyways, with the simplistic lyrics constantly mentioning stuff like the winter solstice, the ringing and chiming of bells, the mistletoe, and even referencing 12 days of Christmas with the line, seven maids move in seven time, you'd imagine this would be about Christmas. And you'd partially be right. It could also be about the celebrations and festivities of Yule, a similar holiday that lasts from the 21st of December to the 1st of January, and could be seen as a prototype for Christmas, similar to how Samhain would be too Christianized as All Hallows Day or Halloween. Either way or both is fine by me. And with all that in mind, this is honestly a pretty underrated Christmas song, and one worth listening to during that time of year. Especially when you're sick and tired of listening to the same old Christmas pop tunes over and over. Like, all I want for Christmas is you. At least, I get easily tired by it.